Hi everyone, today I'll share with you my experience of replacing the stock BLDC motor on a Precision Matthews PM25 milling machine with a servo motor from Dynamic Motor Motion. I'll describe what worked well and what didn't in a question answer format. Uh, first, I must uh, acknowledge uh, Stefan and Michael at DMM. They answered what had to seem like an endless stream of questions. Also, John Elson at Pico Systems for support with the universal stepper motor. What advantages are there of the stock BLDC motor? It's simple, it works. If you're satisfied with it, there's no need to replace it. The drive is uh, repairable with the exception of the microcontroller's code. So why upgrade the BLDC motor? I wanted better performance, especially at low speeds for tapping and drilling. The speed of the BLDC sags under load and overruns when clear, and neither are ideal for maintaining a constant chip load. I also wanted diagnostics, including speed and torque. I wanted higher speeds without compromising torque. I wanted more reliable detection of a spindle fault. Uh, the original BLDC drive has a fault indicator LED, but it lights too long after the actual fault occurs to be useful. Finally, I wanted an easily replaced and documented motor and drive. Why not just replace the original drive? Uh, replacing the stock BLDC drive could satisfy some of the goals. I tried this using an Anaheim automation drive, which is expensive, and the results were terrible. I posted a video detailing that experience. Why a servo motor? Why not a VFD-driven induction motor? Servo motors tend to have higher power density than induction motors. The PM25 is a small mill, and I didn't want to add significant weight to the head. Servos use permanent magnets, while induction motors use coils. This allows the stator of a servo motor to be lighter and more responsive than the induction motor. Servo motors deliver full torque at start, though induction motors may as well, uh, uh, with high-performance VFDs. Finally, uh, servo motors have built-in encoders, and their drives often can pass through the encoder to the controller, possibly eliminating the need for an external uh, encoder on the spindle. Why not a servo motor? Servo motors may be the most expensive solution. Uh, servo motors need to be tuned. Uh, they can pair a measurement to a target and pass a difference to a control loop formula to adjust some aspect of the motor, typically torque current. The control loop formula has a small number of parameters, gain settings, that must be adjusted for the system to perform well. Sometimes auto-tuning is an option. If the load changes significantly, it's possible routining would be required. In a milling application, tuning, uh, turning a, a tool in air is a different load than uh, heavy interrupted cuts. What's the simplest way to interface the servo motor? The Dyne 4 has three control modes, position, velocity, and torque. Uh, control mode selects what is measured to control servo loop air. Uh, velocity control mode is the easiest to interface. Uh, many motor drives, BLDC, induction, servo, will have provisions for varying speed proportional to an analog signal. The original BLDC drive used a 0 to 5 volt signal to control speed and a separate signal to control direction. The Dyne 4 uses a plus minus 10 volt signal to control speed and direction. In Linux CNC, an, the analog signal can be tuned with a lookup table of voltage and measured speed. Linear, linear interpolation is then used to calculate the voltage for any speed. Despite uh, attempts at tuning the Dyne 4, the torque response at low speeds was worse than with the BLDC. I could stall the spindle with my hands at speeds below a few hundred RPM. Uh, with more aggressive gain settings, the motor sounded bad. Uh, your luck may vary, and uh, if you want to only swing a tool with good performance, a servo motor and velocity mode with analog input uh, should be ideal. Is there a more featureful way to interface the servo motor? Position mode gives a great performance at low and high speeds. For, with some programming, position mode enables orienting the spindle for clocking tools for consistent runout or aligning with the uh, spindle lock for manual tool changes. Position mode is commanded by sending pulses to the drive like a stepper motor drive. Uh, in Linux CNC, the pulses are generated using a Hall step gen component, which may be implemented in software or in hardware, such as with the uh, Pico Systems USC. One of the step gen parameters is commanded velocity. 
On the Dyn4, two I.O. pins receive these signals and can be configured for step direction pulses or A-B phase pulses. The Pico Systems USC couldn't generate significantly fast step direction pulses to drive the Dyn4 to higher RPMs with a high PPR electronic gearing. Switching to A-B phase, requiring a change to the Dyn4 configuration and a dip switch change on the USC solved the pulse width bandwidth uh, problem. The USC has uh, four step generators, uh, but they all share the same parameters. The slowest drives then set the limits, which in this case are the lead shine drives on the XYZ axes. Uh, they have longer pulse uh, minimums than the Dyn4. Uh, regardless, with electronic gearing of 512 at 5500 RPM, the minimum pulse width frequency is about 50 kilohertz or a pulse width of 20 milliseconds. So doable within the required longest 10 millisecond pulse width of the lead shine drives. How about torque control mode? I didn't try torque control mode, only velocity and position control modes. Uh, torque control mode is interesting because it means that more of the servo control loop is directed by Linux CNC. Uh, this may be useful if experimenting with uh, control loops. Why not use uh, stock uh, V-belt? Uh, aren't timing belts noisy? Uh, a V-belt runs uninterrupted in grooves and will have little slip if properly tensioned with large pulleys. A timing belt has teeth assuring synchronicity, but the periodic engagement of the teeth creates noise. The sound of the servo and timing belt are different and I don't feel the noise of the timing belt is significant. Uh, securing the drawbar helped reduce the complexity of the sound more than uh, the belt choice. While not a direct comparison, the sound levels between the BLDC with a V-belt and the DMM servo with a timing belt are at 500 RPM, both are 62 plus minus 1 dB without a fan and 65 dB with a fan. At 2500, uh, 2500 RPM, both are 79 plus minus 1 dB and the fan made no difference. Uh, for completeness, the servo at 4,700 RPMs is 86 decibel. Regardless, a pulley cover attenuates much of the noise and should be installed to protect your fingers. Any additional noise implies vibrations, and are the vibrations transmitted to the tool? Uh, realistically, there are far greater sources of vibration in my setup than the choice of belt. The timing belt provides significant functional advantages and any disadvantages seem minor and academic. Uh, choose what you prefer, can get, or can afford. Uh, all being equal, go with the timing belt. Why use the motor's encoder? Isn't a spindle-mounted encoder better? An encoder measures the rotational position of the spindle and is needed for rigid tapping which requires synchronizing the z-axis with the spindle. Any error in the threads are misformed or the tap breaks. Uh, encoder pass-through from the drive is available regardless of the control mode. Both the pulses per revolution and encoder pass-through have configurable scaling factors. I configured 512 pulses per revolution, so native encoder count is dividable without a remainder. Though I'm, I'm not sure this is important. A spindle-mounted encoder is ideal because the spindle is rigidly attached to the tool However, the spindle mounted encoder is a pain when it comes to uh, changing tools because it'll, it likely will interfere. A, spindle, uh, a, a servo motor already has an encoder and some drives pass the encoder signals through, perhaps as a virtual encoder like the Dyn4 after performing a configured scaling. Air between the spindle and the motor mounted encoders are most likely because of belt elongation. A Gates engineer estimated the maximum elongation of the, gel, of the belt that I selected uh, to be uh, nine thousandths of an inch over a span between the uh, pulleys and this does not change with age. So roughly 0.14 percent elongation and a proportional rotational error of the tap in the worst case. Is this significant? Again, there are greater sources of error in my setup, uh, the encoder signal integrity from the drive being the largest. The noise level on the Dyn4 encoder pass-through is terrible. Uh, I made an opto-isolator board to clean this up.
the USC can sample encoders up to one megahertz and the H11 L1 in optocouplers have one megahertz non-return to zero bandwidth. The poor encoder passer seems to be because of noise from the IGBT switching and the Dyn4 uh, block diagram shows a lot of isolation but there is a strong 20 kilohertz noise signal on the logic ground encoder lines and unfortunately it also reaches the pulse lines. I somewhat trust the pass-through signals at low speeds, but at high speeds, the exact position is quickly lost. But, you know, realistically, who is going to tap at 5,000 RPM? Uh, rigid tapping is a cool demonstration of synchronicity. Uh, however, for my small operation, thread milling is generally better than rigid tapping. Thread mills have, uh, are, are much more expensive uh, and are slower than taps, but the range of threads that can be cut by a single thread mill is infinite, including configurations impossible to do with a tap. Uh, could I have made a more complicated setup? Oh yes, and I did. Uh, I thought it would be clever to drive the Linux CNC step gen to the Dyn4 with a PID control loop. The control loop takes the commanded velocity and um, velocity measured from the encoder pass-through, then uh, the Linux CNC PID loop adjusts pulse frequency as needed to get the Dyn4 to the commanded speed. This did not work at all initially because of a bug in Linux CNC. When the enable line shared by the PID loop, encoder, step gen, and drive was toggled, the Linux CNC encoder reset to zero, causing a huge step change in velocity which the PID control loop uh, frantically responded to, resulting in Dyn4 loss phase fault. To work around this, I created a real-time hall component to filter the discontinuity. This complicated strategy works if the encoder signals are solid. At high speeds, the USC misses about 10% of the encoder signal from the Dyn4 due to noise. Um, then Linux CNC thinks the motor is running 10% slow and commands the Dyn4 to run 10% faster than it should be. Add a little bit more noise to the encoder signals and the Linux CNC counters step changes like noise with its own very fast response. All goes nuts and the Dyn4 throws a loss phase fault. Uh, and there is no way to reset the fault without power cycling the drive. In the end, uh, this was a time vampire if the servo drive works well, it should run at the commanded speed without an additional control loop. Uh, there's no need for the extra complications. Why not use a larger power servo than the original 750 watt BLDC? I wanted to compare BLDC and servo motors of the same size. I hear servos are superior, but I'm suspicious of that statement when not backed up by experience with both. I wanted a setup that I could use on the same 120 volt, 15 amp circuit. However, uh, the Dyn4 on 120 volts is only rated to 3000 RPMs. So I installed 240 volt, 15 amp circuit to reach 5000 RPM. With the new service starting over, I would have more options to consider. Uh, someone suggested in Dime, or DMM confirm that um, there is a, a special order one kilowatt motor the same size as the 750 watt servo for roughly twice the cost and both use the same Dyn4 drive. So there is a simple upgrade path for 30% boost in power in exchange for a stack of greenbacks. Based on power measurements I suspect the original BLDC motor is closer to one kilowatt motor than uh, uh, even if it's only capable of reaching that in bursts. Uh, metal removal rate is proportional power, so there's a chance that the 750 watt servo is a step backwards when crudely compared to the original BLDC delivering its highest power. But the servo performs better over a larger range of speeds. If selecting a servo today, I would choose a larger servo, at least one kilowatt. I had a power meter on the BLDC drive, and I would see measurements of one kilowatt when drilling or facing. Uh, based on drilling tests, the Dyn4 has little over the limit tolerance and throws a loss phase or overheat fault near 750 watts. And it's pretty annoying. Why select a servo with a brake? Doesn't the brake harm performance? 
I imagine the brake holding the spindle when changing tools. In reality, the brake is only capable of stopping and holding the motor that it's sized to, and a brake size for a 750 watt motor is pretty small compared to the torque of a long wrench. With the brake, the inertia ratio between the servo motor and the uh, PM25 spindle with a representative tool mounted is roughly 2.5 to 1, and well within the 10 to 1 that Dime recommends and 20 to 1 maximum. The brake is expensive, uh, it's a pain to wire properly, it takes up a lot of space, and there is no right angle connector. The brake may be useful for broaching, uh, which I've never done on the mill, and for emergency stops. Keep in mind that uh, in position mode, the control loop holds position when the drive is enabled, and an emergency stop could be performed by shorting the motor coils, though the Dyn 4 doesn't seem to have an emergency stop mode. Would I order a brake for a spindle application again? Probably not. Would I order a brake for a Z-axis motor? Absolutely. Is there electrical noise from the servo drive? Oh yes. The servo drive has a switching frequency of 20 kilohertz. The output is potentially full current square wave signals. There is a great potential for noise. I redid the CNC electrical moving it from the wall into a cabinet for safety and to create a solid ground plane. I tried ferrite cores on the Dyn4 using an oscilloscope with differential probes and spectrum analyzer with a short antenna to try to measure the improvement. I could see little difference with the cores. There were frequent false faults when starting the motor. It turned out to be noise on the alarm line. Adding a debounce hull component helped, but this is a software fix that reduces the probability of false faults while also increasing the response time to a real fault by uh, 100 milliseconds. The Vista CNC i Mach 3 P4SE spin pendant is uh, very sensitive to the smallest amount of noise. I'm reminded how much I use a pendant every time it stops working and the Dyn 4 would kill it fast. The electrical e-stop is a strong vector for electrical noise into the pendant. I remove the pendant from the electrical e-stop loop, attach it to a USB hub outside of the cabinet. The extended emergency e-stop is a great idea, but it costs an additional $48, and the nuisance e-stop trips are annoying. After a few of those, uh, you quickly start looking for a way to bypass the extended e-stop anyway. And looking at the connector and inside of the extended emergency stop box, my suspicion is the lines carrying the e-stop current are not shielded from the USB signals, and there may be no shielding at all. The Dyn4 has mystery overheat faults. After installing a line reactor and recommended filtering, the input AC waveform is slightly distorted when the drive is operating, but there are never spikes outside of the 240 volt RMS plus minus 10% specification. Finally, be sure to ground the motor and the mill. Uh, first, this should be done for safety, but also to potentially reduce wear on bearings due to induced current passing through the bearings. Should high voltage electronics be installed into their own enclosure? might be nice. Uh, I first installed the electronics on the wall because I didn't have a plan. I wanted to easily make changes and keep costs down. Now I've made an electrical cabinet from wood and a piece of sheet metal for a ground plane. I couldn't find enclosures that were large enough that were not overly expensive. Two smaller enclosures might have uh, multiple advantages over one large cabinet. The isolation uh, might help with electrical noise. Uh, fiberglass cabinets are easy to work with, but I like the idea of EMI isolation um, that the metal cabinets provide. Uh, let me know if you have uh, any suggestions. Could the Dyn for serial interface be used? The serial interface may be preferred over all other methods for controlling a spindle motor. The low baud rate and air checking should make serial communication pretty tolerant to noise. Commands are sent to the drive, and the drive is trusted to execute them. Trust but verify. I created a Python module to communicate with the Dyn4. The code is available on GitHub. I have a Dyn4 with older firmware, but I implemented all the reads and writes that I needed. I used the module to create a user space Linux CNC hall component to command the drive. Linux CNC prefers real-time control, which places constraints on programming. But user space components uh, give one more flexibility, including using Python and modules like PySerial. Uh, there is a, a, a real-time serial component, uh, but this requires a hardware serial port. USB may not be practical to control with real-time constraints. 
Has the surface finish improved? Yes. The first improvements we're seeing while still using the 3D printed motor mounts and milling the aluminum mounts, there were sides that were completely smooth while the BLDC motor would always leave a pattern roughly five tenths deep, best described as what looked like the tool was rocking. At certain speeds, the servo motor created a smooth cut, but not all speeds. Uh, this improvement is most likely due to maintaining a speed that minimizes the problems of a splined uh, spindle. The PM25 spindle has two sections that are splined together. The motor power is delivered to the upper half via a, a pulley and then to the bottom half through a splined shaft. The spline allows the bottom half to move on a rock and pinion implementing a drill like a drill press like spindle, but the uh, freedom reduces rigidity. When I converted this mill, I eliminated the drill press action. And then later to reduce play, I created metal-to-metal -metal contact between the bottom half of the spindle and the head. The screws on the top of the bottom half were changed to low profile ones and the rubber cushion between the bottom half and the head removed. Uh, it was used originally to absorb the spring return of the manual spindle. The metal-to-metal -metal contact stiffened the bottom half, but the spindle still had three thou of play depending on the orientation of the cutting forces uh, to the spindle. The spline has six teeth, uh, so different amounts of play appear as forces align with opposing teeth. To reduce the play, I, I added an interference fitted piece at the top of the top half of the spindle, uh, which has set screws to adjust out uh, spindle runout measured at the spindle nose. Six uh, set screws would be easier to adjust than four, it turns out. Um, besides eliminating the play, securing the spline shaft reduced uh, the rattling noise. Uh, the earliest example I found of this improvement is from Haas, who printed a, a 3D printed a part which mates with the sp uh, spline. Uh, think of the shaft as a lever acting on the nose of the spindle. Uh, set screw method. Uh, seems an improvement over the 3D printed part because it's possible to control runout while a wedge might make it worse. After removing the remaining parts of the drill press like action, including the spring and top hat spring cup, the uh, bottom spindle cartridge is held in place by a single screw pushing on the side of the spindle cartridge. If that screw loosens, the bottom half drops. Uh, to fix that problem, put the spindle in tension by using a custom nut uh, on the top of the spindle. Are the electronics for a CNC retrofit expensive? Yes. Uh, increasing expense is that details about each component are often incomplete or inaccurate, so engineering a complete system without tinkering seems unlikely. Then, as we've seen, either incompatible components need to be replaced or workarounds must be created. Maybe that's the purpose of reports like this video, a little bit of information about how a particular combination of parts worked for one person. It'd be fantastic to use the same electronics for multiple CNC machines. For example, I have a CNC mill and lathe, and the lathe electronics are nearly a subset of the mill's electronics, and rarely have I used both simultaneously. Does the motor run hot? To perform a comparison without a lot of chart junk, I wrote software to generate lossless thermal images with consistent uh, color palettes from FLIR thermography images. The code is on GitHub. DMM said the temperatures are fine. I wanted to help the motor, so I created a shroud that goes around the servo motor with a 24 volt uh, Noctua fan attached to the top. This also gave a convenient place to attach the cable track. The fan is 24 volts so that uh, I can use the same supply as the brake. Currently, if the brake is off so the motor can turn, the fan is operating. I originally had a gasket between the servo motor mount and the mill head to isolate vibration. The servo motor doesn't vibrate. Uh, I'm not sure the isolation is necessary, and removing the isolation allows more heat from the servo motor to be dumped into the mass of the head. Why has this video taken so long to complete? Uh, two months were lost waiting for timing belts. Uh, first, I ordered the wrong style belt and pulleys. Then I ordered the wrong length. Then I forgot to convert the order to or the quote to an order. And each time, two weeks was needed for the order to be uh, completed. Uh, let me know if you need a 3D model of the assembly or bill materials. 
Uh, I lost another month trying to sort out electronic, uh, electrical, and miscellaneous problems. Um, and there's this, and some still remain. I, I, again, Stefan and Michael at DMM and John Elston at Pico Systems helped a lot. Are the Linux CNC configuration files available? All the configuration files that I'm currently using are available on GitHub. Uh, you can also explore past configurations there. Would I do this all again? Uh, maybe, but I would do it differently. Uh, next time, I would write down what my goals were and a plan for how to achieve those goals simply and be weary of any deviation from that plan. Uh, I tend to add a lot of complexity because it's interesting, but that adds a lot of time and the result may not be so useful. Uh, and also, many of the challenges that I encountered are likely because of my particular system and what I was trying to achieve. Your success may be entirely different, and I hope you have an, an easier time with uh, implementing this. <laughs> there are a few items that I'll expand on in short follow-up videos. Uh, let me know if you have any suggestions, and I'd be glad to answer any questions here on Instagram, on Twitter, on my blog, or email, whatever works for you. And finally, thank you for watching, thank you for listening, and thank you for all the love.